Okay, it's done. Okay, so um, the title of my uh, today's talk is Materializing Circular Design in Architecture and Construction. So I would like to speak about a series of strategies and some of the projects that we are developing for materializing circular design principles because um, the way that I believe fabrication or computation or material experimentation should be seen is always with a, a greater goal of what would of what do would we need to achieve no and and it's true that we are um, uh, basically facing um, very big challenges in the world and uh, it's very important to um, uh, have a kind of a more sustainable or circular design approach so why why is it really important uh, to talk about this um, first of all, because the engineering and the construction industry is the world's largest consumer of raw materials. We know that it consumes more than three billion uh, tons of raw materials annually. And then, um, of course, at the same time today, concrete is the most consumed material. Uh, it's second only to water in the planet and, and with three tons per year, uh, used for every person in the world. So it is the second most widely used substance on earth. And we know that it is also the most destructive material on earth in terms of CO2 emissions, as well as natural uh, resources uh, that uh, requires in order to, 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 to be formed. No? Um, some of you probably also know that the building sector is one of the world's largest waste generator. Uh, construction and demolition waste accounts for approximately 30% of all waste in the European Union, but also there are similar numbers in the world. And all this, this data basically is a consequence of our existing cleaner model of make, use and dispose. No, this is the way that we produce and we consume. But if we aim to restore our current human and architectural impact in the planet, then we need to work towards um, more circular systems um, in architecture. Those circular systems aim to close or limit material and resource loss while having the potential to minimize waste and using this waste uh, very important as a resource um, in itself. And for such circular thinking, nature uh, becomes a very solid base to learn from. Nature operates in the principle of abundance rather than scarcity, for example, while waste is a concept that nature doesn't recognize in its operation and, it is and, and in, in its life cycles. Nature only recognizes resources. So uh, byproducts of certain operations becomes resources for other systems or, or for other life cycles uh, to operate. And I think this is a big uh, and important lesson that we need to, to, to learn, let's say. So how can we minimize uh, waste in architecture? And how can we make a shift from a mindset of scarcity to, um, to a one of abundancy? So I would like to discuss uh, two ways. Um, uh, one is the introducing circular materials in architectural design and construction. And the second way is digitize matter so that we can deal with buildings as material banks. And I will further explain in a while what do I mean with this. Let's first start with um, uh, waste. No? Uh, for introducing the idea of circular materials in architectural design, the, ver the first thing we need to do is to work on understanding the potential of waste especially the agricultural and organic waste to be transformed in valuable construction materials. Some of the projects that we are working uh, and we're developing at IAC include, for instance, creating structural building composites of biochar. I don't know if you are aware of, but bio, of what biochar is, but it's basically the byproduct of the pyrolysis of organic and agricultural waste. So in principle, we are talking about a solid material that it is mainly sequestrated carbon, no? So in um, buildings with biochar or building with uh, such material means developing not just zero, but negative carbon um, uh, solutions for architecture. 
and we're working on developing columns, beams, or structural walls with biochar with the goal of achieving buildings that are made out of CO2 instead of buildings that emit CO2. And um, the most interesting, let's say, part of this work is that biochar is actually an excellent soil fertilizer. So when the life cycle of the building or the structure that we are um, um, uh, erecting with this material, when this life cycle is over, then the material can be separated and can, be, can go back to soil to fertilize it. So can you imagine, let's say, building bricks that are negative carbon and can afterwards feed our soil for increasing, for example, agricultural production? These are um, uh, very, very uh, important concepts that we need to have. So, of course, how can we use uh, fabrication techniques or how can we use material research for that? This work has been basically initiated in the study of digital matter that I lead at IAC, and now it is uh, being continued by one of my PhD students, Nicole Kirova. And um, we're trying to test different manufacturing methods, such as casting or 3D printing. Casting, on the one hand, could give the, the possibility of reinforcement, while at the same time, it, it can also tackle the existing way of how uh, uh, concrete is being produced in the market. While 3D printing, on the other hand, could offer the possibilities of creating, for instance, functionally graded materials based on structural performance or even environmental performance. So 3D printed, in a way, could also be suspended in concrete pool while casting can eventually happen uh, as well in a 3D printed formwork, as, as you can see in some of those uh, images. Now, in the case of a column, for instance, we can see that 3D printing could allow us to select the most appropriate geometry uh, and the most appropriate column mass with the goal to lower the aborted carbon. And we can analyze and, and, and we can simulate um, um, the embodied carbon in each one of these scenarios. Of course, here the material mix and, and, and the composite with uh, natural additives or fibers becomes as well a fundamental parameter for moving towards more, uh, let's say, sustainable um, concrete composites. And in the case of the beam, topological optimization can be part of the process so that it can support our design and manufacturing in order to define the appropriate mix uh, of these materials I was referring to. And once again, here, we can develop a series of scenarios in material mixtures that could be analyzed um, uh, in terms of carbon mass and um, an embodied carbon. And then of course, um, deposit material or, or cast material only where we actually need certain structural forces uh, in, in, in our piece. Um, in the case of the load uh, bearing wall, um, the parameters of design optimization can actually expand. It's not only structural performance we are searching here, but also thermal or acoustic insulation or interior air circulation for passive heating. And uh, here again, uh, as you can see, we're able to analyze the different data so that we can decide which um, uh, is the most appropriate um, design in terms of uh, thermal performance, but also in terms of uh, embodied carbon mass. At the end of the day, although this work is still uh, a work in progress, we're envisioning that the final result could be something as simple as the one that we can see in the screen, a simple shift in the geometry of certain structural elements of traditional constructions. And of course, parameters would include what I have already, or what I have already been mentioning, such as a variety of slab thicknesses based on the load, irregular distribution of vertical support elements, and uh, load um, bearing elements that they are enhanced to regulate, for instance, humidity, increased thermal uh, or acoustic performance uh, in the building. Now, beyond uh, upcycling materials, which is uh, the project that I, I decided to show you, um, um, beyond, let's say, waste uh, as, as a future material, we should not forget that there is a whole world of abundance uh, materials in nature, something that we seem that we have uh, forgotten while we got stuck in 
steel and concrete revolution. Now, Earth is one of the most abundant materials and resources in our planet. And of course, this is not new because for centuries we have been uh, uh, building um, uh, in architecture with this material. But um, what we have developed at IAC in the last years um, is that we are actually revisiting earth constructions and technologically enhance them uh, for building affordable and circular housing. So together with our researchers and our students as well, we have developed an earth-based material which is enhanced with bioadditives and that basically requires no firing. So it is biodegradable, it is natural, it is locally found. And since it requires no firing, that means that once you build a prototype or a housing and its lifespan is over, then you can reuse that material to construct another one. And um, in the beginning, we have been using um, our robotic arms and our robotic facilities at IAC, a small, well, it's not small, but a robotic arm, let's say to uh, 3D print, uh, either small elements uh, such as columns or uh, components of, of, um, of, a, of a wall uh, that uh, you can see on the right. But uh, beyond, let's say, using our robots in, the, um, in our facilities, I will close the sound here, it's not necessary. What beyond, let's say, using our robots, what we were interested in is to be able to find ways of bringing machine and robots on the construction site. At IAC, we have been working the last um, uh, decade on the potential of robotic manufacturing and especially additive manufacturing for on-site construction. On-site construction is a powerful concept for reducing, on the one hand, the ecological uh, cost, but also the monetary cost of transporting materials and equipment, and it also offers the possibility of using locally sourced materials, so materials that we can find on site. And we know, of course, that additive manufacturing, on the other hand, is a radical digital manufacturing technique that can reduce waste since there is no need uh, of joints or molds, um, and uh, we actually deposit material only where we need it. The project that you see here is a project uh, back in 2012, I think, that we developed together with uh, uh, Joris Larman Lab. And um, we have been working uh, with developing um, a, con a technique for 3D printing uh, three-dimensional curves, what we called it 3D printing in the air. Now, the interesting part of this research was, uh, well, there are different uh, interesting parts of, of that research, but um, the most significant for us uh, was the fact that we were imagining that we can bring those robots on site to fabricate. Of course, um, once you are um, doing the research with a robotic arm, you have the limitation that um, you need huge machines in order to produce on site, let's say, um, uh, big buildings. So you need uh, machines that they are bigger than uh, the building um, themselves. And um, this pro project made us realize that we need to, let's say, rethink our printers or rethink our tools. And um, this is how we got to our next research, which is um, these guys. Um, we have looked to robotic engineering and to swarm our robots in order to learn how we can build our own tools, how we can build robots that they can go on site and they are not necessarily huge in order to produce uh, big uh, structures. Let me play this video. Well, well uh, for a reason the video is not here, but um, it doesn't matter. Um, this is a project that it's called uh, Mini Builders. Uh, and uh, we have created these small mobile machines that can print, print bigger than the size of, uh, uh, than their size, no? And, and we bring them on site. There is one robot that creates the foundation of the structure, there is another robot that prints in layers, and there is a third vacuum robot that can uh, uh, climb into the structure and that, that can print, print uh, vertically. And um, I'm showing those two projects uh, just to clarify, not for the sustainability of their material, because in both cases, we have been using thermoset polymers. Our goal here was not the material, but the technique of um, uh, printing with uh, different kinds of machines. So I want you to stay here with the possibility of having 
small machines or easily transported machines that they can go uh, on site. And once we start combining this with more um, natural materials, then uh, it becomes a, a pretty interesting solutions for um, on-site and sustainable construction. So obsessed with the idea of mobile machines and robots that can allow us to easily go on site and cover big, big uh, area of uh, construction, we came across with this um, machine. Um, it is a machine that one of our partners, Technalia, has been using. It's a, it's a cable robot and they have been using it to either move uh, heavy pieces um, of, um, um, of uh, packaging or they have also been using it to paint uh, aeroplanes. And when we saw that, we, we, we thought that this could be a um, great possibility because it's a, it's a very similar um, um, machine than the ones that they are using in stadiums for following uh, the football players. So there is a very simple way of setting it in, in, on site um, um, and uh, um, it's a kind of a very, very easy uh, machine to transport, no? So what we did is we decided to hack this machine and transforming it, and transforming it uh, into a huge 3D printer. So we have um, designed and we have uh, manufactured a nozzle, a nozzle that could use our earth material. And then we have attached uh, this nozzle to the machine. And we have managed to create um, a very big uh, 3D printer of uh, fired clay, um, easily transportable, um, but also um, a machine that could cover a big area for, for uh, prototyping. So um, we have used uh, this uh, machine in different uh, scenarios. Uh, the, the biggest one was that we uh, participated in one um, exhibition in the biggest construction fair in, in Spain, actually. And we have decided to set up the machine inside the exhibition and to print a pavilion uh, a real time during the four days of the exhibition. That was a demonstration to explain to people how quickly we can print, how big we can go in, um, in very limited time. And of course, um, the details of the geometry and the aesthetics that we can achieve. And um, we have also used it to build smaller prototypes that they are structured, that they have certain structural performance, but also uh, thermal performance so that they can um, uh, offer possibilities of passing cooling, for instance, in our buildings. And uh, during this prototype, we have also used other um, robots, uh, such as aerial uh, uh, robots, uh, drones, as you can see in this uh, picture, and we use them so that we can real time uh, scan what we have been already printing and be able to test on the one hand the geometry and on the other hand, the state of the curing of the material so that we can know if we are ready to um, uh, print um, uh, the next layers because, you know, in clay and in most of materials that they are not thermoset uh, polymers, we need to have some time for the material to cure before deposit um, um, the next layer. So uh, we were very excited with this research and this project and we tried to bring it uh, to the industry. And then we realized that although they were uh, accepting that project very positively and they were surprised and they were interested, they were whatsoever not very interested in testing it into the real market. And that is because of course, um, many industries uh, or, or not all industries uh, have a priority of sustainability or resilience, but they are more focused on speed and profit. So they were not very keen on that. But, you know, sometimes uh, impact uh, could also come from uh, uh, other organization or other institutions, not necessarily the company in the market. And we have been working, for instance, with the UN Habitat that saw a great potential to create um, huge uh, urban areas in Africa and Asia that they are 100% uh, natural material um, uh, origin and they are dealing also with extreme climates um, so that we can offer solutions for affordable and, and passive houses. Now low cost sustainable houses that are 100% recyclable, they are natural and more than anything they involve the community in their design and construction and, and that might give 
solution to displaced populations in the world. So it is an interesting way to put digital technologies such as robots or additive manufacturing and computation to the service of people and communities in need, enriching these um, uh, digital technologies and processes, of course, with the feedback of those uh, communities. So with uh, um, uh, people, cultural background, and of course, uh, with the crafts and the knowledge they have. And I want to highlight here that although many connect earth architecture with developing countries, we also foresee that um, earth-based constructions could happen in the, west past, in the west part of the world as well, no? You can see here some examples in, in Barcelona or in other European cities. Um, and we believe that um, these solutions could radically question the contemporary concrete manufacturing, the environmental footprint of our current buildings, and even open um, uh, possibilities and discussions of new aesthetics that could appear um, uh, in our urban environments. So um, apart from um, uh, earth, we know that timber is another natural material that we can actually grow and use for sustainable construction. I know that you're working a lot in your seminar with timber and class, of course, is an expert of timber construction. But within a circular design thinking, what is important is where this timber is coming from and, of course, and eventually where it goes afterwards, no? So what you can see in this picture is our IAC uh, forest campus. Um, the Valdaura campus inside the Colserola Park, which is a natural park. Um, it's only 20 minutes driving from Barcelona. I don't know if class has been there, has, has visited this. And it includes uh, 130 hectares of uh, forest. And one of our goals in this campus is to be able to locally generate all the resources that we need uh, from energy and food to materials uh, for construction. So uh, in terms of materials, uh, in collaboration with the park, uh, in collaboration with forest experts and with arborists, we are growing and managing our forest for locally producing timber that then we can process and we can use it to build um, uh, prototypes of self-sufficient buildings together with our students that they are studying in our immersive master um, of um, ecological buildings that takes place in Valdaura. Here are some of the prototypes that uh, students and faculty develop every year at the end um, of, their, uh, of their studies. And um, timber, we all know that is actually um, uh, a negative carbon material since during its lifetime, it has sequestrated CO2. So in this project, uh, we're interested not only to build with a natural, negative carbon material, but also to make sure that this material is a zero kilometer material, is a local material that we can eventually grow as close as possible um, to the construction site. Now, um, it is also important to realize that circular design is not just about using natural materials or upcycling waste. Um, circular design, it uses uh, as few resources as possible in the first place, and it keeps resources in circulation for as long as possible. That makes design a very fundamental action uh, uh, in circular economy. It, 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 it poses uh, the action of design as a very relevant one. For instance, design for longevity, uh, with reparability in mind or designed for disassembly are crucial so that materials can be easily dismantled and be reused when the lifespan uh, of a building um, is over. Now, this idea introduces uh, new concepts on, on building evaluation. For instance, buildings could be considered um, as material banks, having material passports, understanding and knowing exactly for its building the exact material value as well as the exact origins uh, and possible destination of its material that is being used uh, within um, that building. Um, design for disassembly is a concept uh, in which buildings and products um, are designed internationally, I mean, in, intentionally, sorry, they are designed intentionally for a material recovery for um, value um, retention and, of course, meaningful next use, as I was saying. Now, in such process, it is fundamental to think of, on the one hand, 
modular building elements, uh, but also the way that these elements are being put together. In, in the example that you see in the screen, we use robots to assembly or disassembly, but of course it can be other, other uh, technologies and other ways to do so. Now, in these examples of design for disassembly, we design material systems from scratch and we order the wood in order to build our prototypes, not really knowing exactly where this wood is coming from. Um, and we are uh, actually creating something out of scratch. But what about the existing building stock that could be found uh, in our existing buildings? An exciting aspect of the circular design and the circular thinking is that we can consider um, uh, existing buildings as material banks, as I was saying, and that we can work on different technologies of mapping, tracing, or scanning this existing building mass in order to evaluate which one uh, of these materials could be reused and create alternative uh, material libraries for construction. Now, one way to digitize matter in, in, uh, in these existing buildings is through scanning technologies using um, uh, drones, uh, using aerial vehicles. And um, uh, you can see here um, uh, some projects developed in our robotics uh, and advanced construction program uh, at IAC. We have been using drones to scan the building um, elements of our facilities in Barcelona and collect data on their size, on their type, and on their materiality. Now, once processing these data through algorithms and computation, we were able to create categories of different building elements and materials, such as, for example, concrete blocks, wooden beams, or uh, uh, bricks, um, um, uh, brick walls, uh, that can be reused uh, in another building, for instance, uh, in the future. Here, you can see some um, possibilities developed by our students on the reuse of um, our facilities in Barcelona. So they are envisioning that uh, when the lifespan of IAC is uh, over, then some of these materials could be used uh, as facade systems for other buildings, uh, for regulating light, or even for creating some building uh, gardens um, uh, in this uh, new construction or in, in uh, rehabilitation of other buildings. Now, what it is important is that such concepts and processes they can introduce um, new evaluation criteria that we can set up for buildings. For the moment, we are usually uh, use uh, certain certificates such as the LEED certificate in terms of energy, but we can even do something similar for um, uh, materials, no? And, and, and this is where um, I was, this is why I was mentioning that buildings could have material passports, could be a kind of a certificate in order to understand um, the value that this building has in terms of disassembly, but also in terms of origins of their material. Of course, in order to do that, especially the disassembly part, uh, we need to have certain infrastructures, right? So uh, uh, we're also um, uh, envisioning that there should be certain circular hubs in the cities um, uh, where uh, these materials could be sorted, uh, could be processed if necessary, could be separated, and then um, uh, could become, uh, let's say, uh, the central infrastructure uh, to create these um, libraries for, for uh, materials that they can be reused. Now, similar techniques uh, of monitoring and scanning could also be extrapolated in natural environments that surround our cities, such as forests or, or natural parks. Uh, this is a project that we did in our natural park, in our campus in the mountains. Um, and, and here we have developed uh, photographic photogrammetry. We have used photogrammetry um, uh, in order to digitize the forest and create a digital twin of existing timber resources. Now, through photogrammetry, we are able to scan the existing trees, detect the ones that could be uh, cut, and create a database of their trunk morphology and their properties. So eventually build a catalog of design solutions with this um, um, uh, customized, let's say, uh, trunks no, that we can find. This is a very important process of optimizing resources because the existing uh, timber industry produces huge amounts of waste. Although the timber is a natural 
the sustainable material, the process is not as, as sustainable as it could be. So in order to get, for example, the straightest uh, element of timber and the best quality of them, we discard a big part of biomass and we create waste which can be significantly reduced if we manage to audit accurately our existing resources and then couple this um, um, uh, auditing with the design creativity and optimization. The idea of digitization of matter I've shown here uh, how it could be applied into existing buildings in the cities or in the uh, forest and in parks, but it can also be um, um, applied at an urban scale. Here is a project that we're working in our city and technology program, and it uses artificial intelligence techniques such as computer vision and machine learning in order to analyze huge amounts of geotagged uh, street views images and create building stock classification uh, um, I mean, maps of building stock classifications, such as, for instance, um, detailed maps of concrete, uh, steel or timber buildings, maps of level of um, um, deteriorized uh, buildings, uh, or urban maps with geolocated data on buildings that are to be demolished, uh, and therefore uh, knowing which uh, kind of materials could be reused in the next few years. So um, further analyzing um, the digital matter data of, of this process at the urban scale, we can then come up with entire libraries of building uh, uh, facades, for instance, based on their dimension, their materiality, or even their age and their state, of course. And such libraries um, have um, huge potential to promote new circular design operations uh, in the building industry, such as uh, on the right of this image, you can see a, a, a great application, uh, a brilliant reuse of entire brick facade clocks that they are upcycled uh, in Copenhagen from the historic, historical uh, Carlsberg Brewery. So um, I, I, I think that uh, in a way um, we've seen like different uh, processes uh, of, of how we can uh, use uh, circular design, not only in terms of materials, but also in terms of uh, fabrication of the use of technologies um, that we can use. But more than anything, um, uh, this idea of, of using our technological tools with um, um, a purpose that could serve, let's say, or could minimize the existing impact um, uh, of construction industry. Now I would uh, I would sum up um, um, by highlighting that materializing uh, circular design in architecture and construction is an urgent action. It's an urgent action that we architects are called um, uh, to take in order to minimize our industry negative impact, and we are urged to come up with alternative material models to the prevailing ones that um, are basically models of. Um, um, resources uh, consuming and contaminating. No, 40% of the energy that we consume in cities come from buildings. And of course, we already saw data in CO2 emissions and in the waste generation. So that mindset requires a lot of different technologies and a lot of, a lot of uh, new creative processes as well, which is why your work that we're doing uh, as students in the school, but also the work that we're doing as researchers and um, um, uh, professionals is very, very important. Now, from using natural abundant uh, resources such as earth-based uh, materials uh, for housing, as we have seen, to auditing and monitoring existing material resources that can be reused or turning our uh, urban waste streams into construction matter, it is clear that our discipline needs to rethink its operation while we also need to educate differently the future architects and the future uh, building experts. So um, I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion that we can have. That was a short introduction. I am uh, actually more uh, interested into the discussion that we can have all together or into possible questions that we might have. And um, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you for listening. Okay, well, wow. um, thanks for, for this uh, broad overview and, and your interest in the, the whole life cycle of... I think I was in time class, right? Sorry?
Yeah, totally. Don't worry. We have all the time of the world, no? I mean, if, it's, been, if it's an interesting debate, I mean, I, I guess well, it's, it's your time that is more precious here, I believe. So, um, yeah, sorry, class. I was, I, I had my, my sound off because of the video and I, I lost your. Uh... Okay. Can the others hear me? I think so. No. Yeah, no, no. It was, it was my, it was my. Ah, okay. No, no, I think your time is more precious. So we're happy to, the, the time, um, as long as we can discuss and talk and, and, and see about the future, I think everybody's happy to discuss all night long, let's say. Um, no, a, a very positive and, and uh, fantastic feedback on the wide range of what the life cycle would include and where you people in, at the school already try to bring solutions to the built environment, really with practical praxis-based uh, things and building by doing. So I think that's, that's quite impressive. And um, to, to go in that direction, maybe two things, like how important do you see that uh, the, the, this generation of architects really builds uh, during their studies and touch material? And also maybe related to that, how important do you think it is also to go or to make relations with the constructed reality and the means, and what I mean by that is how far should we go into be in touch with uh, construction companies, for example, right? Um, maybe, yeah. yeah, I mean, that would be a question <laughs> Me and myself, I don't see any questions now at the moment in the chat. I see one about biochar. I will answer that in a while. Um, let me take a first uh, uh, class. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it is a question, but uh, first of all, um, as I was saying, we need to start thinking differently on how we can use the tools that we have. For many years, we have been amazed by the possibilities of uh, computation and manufacturing, and we have been uh, you know, producing a lot of a lot of uh, digitally based images. Some of them were impossible actually uh, to construct. So it was a kind of a speculative, very very valuable moment of um, you know like uh, testing what we can do. Uh, and then with um, the accessibility to manufacturing tools such as robots and 3D printers and milling machines at the schools um, or or at small offices we were able to start designing in a different way. So we started designing by prototyping, uh, learning by this prototyping, and then going back to design in a kind of a circular way that it is much more optimized than before, because before you needed to go to, to create um, um, uh, mock-ups in, in a kind of a more pro complex process, no? So I think that um, uh, uh, in order to take the maximum advantage of these technologies, Pilot learning by doing, like prototyping is very important, but also building pilot projects. And then pilot project, as you were saying, um, uh, cannot be done inside the school only because then this uh, limits, let's say, the possibility of getting it in, into the market or into affecting, let's say, the industry or into even uh, uh, impacting into creating regulations because one of the, of the reasons that the construction industry is very slow into innovation is basically because certain regulations um, um, don't allow it uh, to, to, to bring the innovation of research into practice. So pilot projects in collaboration with industries, um, uh, with stakeholders such as city administration and even users is very, very fundamental process um, and it's not always easy to do it, but uh, there are different kind of frameworks that these pilot projects could happen. In our case, we use the European uh, research funded project as a way uh, to um, create prototypes uh, in these consortiums. Um, we have not only industries and, and um, architects involved, but we also have uh, um, city administrators, which means that in a way they are uh, forced to test some of these prototypes, no? So um, it is very important, this uh, multi-stakeholder involvement in that process. And we need to, to um, yeah, be more efficient on the way that we are setting this up, not only schools, but also in, in, the, uh, in the professional environments of the different offices and industries. It's, it's a very interesting topic you touched there. It's, it's incredible because, the last 
three speakers. We had exactly, we, we went in this direction too, that regulations are really uh, a lot of red tape to our developments. And they are of course to protect uh, people there, but we see that they are also slowing down certain innovation and how to go around that, no? And that's where you say the pilot projects, the experimenting one, uh, scale one, I think it's hugely important and there's too much legal framework around this to help us much on that. We see it even with the 3D printing, whereas uh, non-reinforced concrete is actually not, you cannot really use it in, in buildings. I mean, that's, that's a, a really important topic and just I've read, no, I had to correct a, a paper the other day from some people from India working on this, well, very with very low skilled uh, people on construction construction site, um, but making a very complex building, a shell structure of 600 square meters, and there, so the computation helped to really intelligently fabricate it and even make it possible to to let it read by very low skilled people that regularly build regular walls, but they gain on material. And there the regulations in India are a lot, they are allowing for a lot more. There's no, the insurances don't have the real power that they would have in France or in Germany or in other countries for that matter. And so and the, the, my question would be, how do you see it there? Because it seems like in Africa or in Asia, it's maybe easier or in South America to, to innovate more in this direction than it would be in Western Europe, say. I mean, I've worked with Solano Benitez. I think you know him too, which is with the BRICS things. What he can do in South America, we, we, I could simply hardly do it in France. Yeah, it. no, it's true. The same happened. We had a project in, in Lebanon, in, in Beirut, for instance, and, and uh, there are some um, um, places in the world that uh, um, the regulations are more flexible than others. But I think this is something that you can find in, in every aspect of, of uh, you know, like society and, and, and living. So um, it's, it's normal that there are different regulations. What I find more challenging is, um, you know, to create this kind of, um, um, let's say, to, to open up uh, discussions so that there is certain flexibility into certain norms. Uh, and uh, I understand perfectly that mm, regulations cannot change from one day to another. Uh, but if we have um, the possibility within a framework uh, to, uh, let's say, build uh, these pilot projects, then the responsible people for um, adapting regulations could actually have something real to evaluate. And I think this is the main problem now. There are very few uh, projects that can go up in real scale uh, so that they could be eventually analyzed on their impact or on their, fa on, on their failures and their successes. And, and that's why we need to be much more, um, let's say, uh, experimental. I think that there is a, the initiative of uh, the European Bauhaus, for instance, coming from the European Commission, is a very, very interesting uh, initiative for funding projects that they are actually doing what we are asking. No, They are bringing together arts and technologies and architecture and to innovate and, and build prototypes that would eventually be applied into the new regulations that Europe would bring into different aspects of our industry. So um, there is, uh, let's say, um, there are some initiatives happening uh, and, and I think that we all need to push towards that direction. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, we've been at the forefront somehow with my professional practice on, on certain of these things too. And of course we see that there's possibilities, but these are mostly one-offs. And there, the role of the universities could become more important again, that they are helping actually to change the code and the approach to things. And so here, what is, I don't know how you think about it. So there's other questions, but let me finish this thought maybe just before we move on. Is uh, traditionally the architects, at least in Europe, have not been at the forefront of doing material research. They have been in typology research and, and all these things, maybe in the 70s, if you're talking about Fry Otto or even 
Torocha in the 50s, maybe the architects were much closer to these debates, but somehow, again, I don't know how we lost the discussion under, under, under the way, but material research has traditionally been taken over by engineers that look at the low carbon footprint just directly. But it has, the architectural offices or the architectural schools haven't been much helping in any regulation in Europe for that matter, which is a little bit problematic in that sense that they are the ones that are creating space. So, and I believe the fact that we are now going with schools like your postmaster, even in Versailles, where we have a fab lab now, where we could actually promote experimentation, uh, let the space planning and, 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 the conceive and the conception of space material be one of the parameters or the, the or the or the input parameters at least for for making architecture and this if, if I see that it's happening in schools and I don't know how it's going to be but I, I guess that's I think I mean that that is super super important what you're saying and I think that in, in most of the schools now that um, I mean the fact that certain again um, certain technologies uh, of infrastructure have become accessible, uh, the machines that we have been talking about, the digital manufacturing, then the culture is changing uh, slowly, slowly into transforming these sterilized classrooms uh, of, of teaching into more laboratories where people could get their hands dirty and they could prototype. So this is the material uh, experimentation or exploration is part of um, a different culture of how uh, an architect is being trained and how an architect is being educated and eventually how uh, uh, it make um, uh, it set up, he or she set up um, um, their practice later. So uh, it is fundamental, material uh, exploration is fundamental, but it's not the only one because <clears throat> I think that um, architects for a long time now, for the last decade, we have been, uh, I mean, it's a very, it's a very peculiar discipline we have, no? There is a very, um, there, is a, there is a big uh, whiz for uh, this creative gesture, uh, this um, uh, copyright thing, you know, like uh, how many engineers do we know by their name and surname and how many architects, right? So there is a kind of a discipline that uh, it's very much based on the ego uh, of the creator. And I think that this is um, uh, something that um, um, is changing now because we need to open up into different disciplines, not only the material science discipline, for instance, but also other ones, computer science, uh, data science, um, uh, let's say um, um, biology, ecology. There are so many different disciplines now that they need to start um, becoming part of the uh, of the knowledge, uh, the expertise, and the experimentation of the architect, and and that would radically change not only the way that we design and we we um, uh, we manufacture, but it would also change the way that we set up our offices. You know, every time more and more disciplinary teams could be found. I'm pretty sure that I know that in your office, you're also based in a, in a very multidisciplinary way. So. Um, material is a very fundamental aspect, but also, I mean, in our case, we're working a lot with data. So data science is also very, very important, you know, to understand complexity of urban environments, to understand like a, a accurate data of, of energy consumption of, of all the different buildings. Um, and of course, uh, ecologies that would give us, uh, you know, ways of, of how nature-based solutions could be applied. Uh, or, or other kind of um, uh, alternative ways uh, in, in, in the construction process. Yeah, no, I great to. I, I will leave some space here for the for the people that have to ask yeah, the this, question. There's just the to answer, I see that there is one question about the biochar, and yes, uh, biochar is charcoal. It's not a brand. It's it's uh, uh, it's a type of uh, specific analysis of organic matter. Organic matter could be, for example, organic waste, or it could be agricultural waste, or it could be timber uh, waste from the timber industry. So that's how uh, biochar is being created. The interesting thing with biochar is that based on how you set up the chambers of um, pyrolysis and the temperature of pyrolysis, then you can have solid matter biochar that it has different properties, you know, according to what is the raw material, but according to what is the temperature of this uh, process. 
So um, what is interesting, of course, biolysis is not very sustainable, no? But what is interesting is that this is already an existing process, for example, in the biomass in order to generate energy. So you can combine uh, the existing infrastructures of energy generation based on biomass and you can actually extract um, um, the solid matter of, of CO2 in the form of, of biochar with different properties. Is that clear? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I also pasted, yes, thank you very much. I also pasted the thing from uh, Wikipedia that, that explains it a bit, but it's, I think it's always good to have your direct uh, input here. Uh, the next ah, okay, was, somebody put it in the Wikipedia. I see that now. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's perfect. And then is there a way to include uh, uh, Finition? That's like the... Um, About, uh, finishing. Yeah, uh, to smooth the layers from Raphael. I, I guess you're talking about the 3D printing with Earth, right? Because, yeah, I mean, in, in actually, in that's a question that most of the interested clients are doing, you know? Can we have a traditional fencing with this uh, innovative, innovative technique? The answer is yes, we can. We did, uh, we, we did some... Uh, uh, prototypes with finishings that they look like plaster, right? Um, um, but for, for us, the most interesting thing is that, you know, this kind of new process and new material, uh, its value is also the fact that you can see different aesthetics and that you can see different kind of colorings and, 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 and outcomes. But yes, it is possible to have a traditional finishing. Then from uh... layers, the resolution of the layers, um, Depends on the res on, on the on the on the um, uh, on the nozzle that you're using. No, the smaller the nozzle, the highest the higher resolution. But the problem with the architectural scale is that you need to print big. So if you are having extremely high resolution and extremely small nozzle, then it takes forever to print. So um, I mean, this is something that um, that in construction in construction industry we know well that there is certain degree of allowance in the accuracy, no? So in, in a way, uh, the bigger you go, um, the resolution uh, could be lost for the uh, for the favor of speed or not, but then you have other kind of complexities in terms of how much time it takes. If it goes slower, it's always easier because then you can better control, you know, like the viscosity of the material, the curing time of the material, but speed is a very important part of sustainability as well. So we're working on, on, on leveraging that. Okay, Judith, who's online with us and uh, has a very interesting question, not an easy one, but a very interesting one, is what about the differences in the way we design and represent uh, raw earth soil in opposition to classical concrete in the process of the project? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you... you, you I mean... Yeah, please. What I mean, excuse me. What I mean is that um, I know that when we design a project, to say like my last project was in uh, raw earth and soil, and I had to go from existing um, uh, buildings that were in concrete. So the way I represent those existing concrete buildings was much different than how I have to represent raw earth with the thickness which is much higher because uh, when building in earth, I have to take, let's say, 50, 60 centimeters in thickness, when in concrete is only 25. Oh, so quite oh. change in the, in the concepts, how I conceptualize um, buildings and projects will automatically change if I use raw earth and um, I wanted to know your process. Yeah, no, no, this is an important question, same, same, same as we know that there are differences between steel and concrete, right? Steel structure and concrete structure. No, I think that uh, the, um, uh, the clay, the earth-based architecture, first of all, um, uh, it has certain limitations in terms of structural performance. Uh, it is a very, very heavy material. Um, and of course, um, uh, it requires, uh, you know, like uh, uh, bigger thicknesses, for example, of load bearing walls. But the fact that we're 3D printing that material also means that they, I don't know if you remember in my slides, the interior, the infill of that uh, wall could be worked in a different way so that we can allow uh, air circulation. And that air circulation on the one hand 
uh, benefits the building uh, with passive cooling. On the other hand, benefits the fabrication process because it also helps the material in the interior to dry quicker so that we can deposit the next layer, no? So um, um, there, are, there, there, are, there are, let's say, uh, there are a lot of uh, limitations, but also we can work with the limitations in order to offer new possibilities. Um, uh, and of course, uh, as I was saying, the, um, the, um, the process of 3D printing is radically different from casting, which is how concrete is being uh, mainly produced. So mm -hmm. that also opens up possibilities in terms of the geometries that you can achieve without the necessity of molds that they could then be wasted or, or, or trust out. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, I think it's a good question to maybe we'll let you off the hook for today, uh, Areti. It would have been nice to have you around in, in Versailles to to show you the school, but you've been there for the... Yeah, I would, I would, I've been there and I would love to come back, hopefully very soon. Yeah, let's hope uh, that our students make a brilliant project so that you want to come by anyway to see it. Uh, we'd be happy to receive you, of course. And... Um, Thank you so much for this, these insights for the students and for the other people that were watching. Definitely also do check out, uh, I think, the IAC, uh, where you have been successful in breeding this kind of new kind of people, this kind of hybrids that are looking into all directions and bringing in interesting topics uh, all over uh, Areti. I think it's beautiful. And I haven't unfortunately been at your location outside of Barcelona. I'm still planning to do that, so I'll, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> but uh, to everyone, it's it's really, it's fantastic school also. Please uh, check it out, what they're doing. And I think there's individual workshops, even in summer schools and all this, that are definitely worth uh, visiting. And even on this raw earth, I think you have ones on uh, Torchy and all these techniques too that are existing already. So, um, to, to all those that have been watching and have been asking questions. Thank you so much. That's really beautiful. It's, it's, thank uh, you everybody. Good luck with your projects. Um, think out of the box and use all the technologies that class is teaching you then the knowledge that class is teaching you in order to produce things that you can surprise him and us uh, in the construction industry. I'm looking forward to see your work uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. See you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, Bye already.